Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Mr. Coffee. I'd also introduce you to Mr. Radar too, but that wasn't in the budget for this episode. But between you and me, this, in my opinion, is the single best improvement that anyone has ever fitted to a milling machine ever in all time. You may just want to add a bit of corrosion inhibitor to your coffee, you know, along with your milk and sugar and whatnot. On a more serious note though, can you believe that it's been, what, two and a half years since I bought this mill? But in that time, I've tried a lot of things to improve the mill, both machining-wise, but also quality of life-wise. Because you know, at the end of the day, it's still a small, light-duty milling machine. And you know, small, lightweight, and milling machine don't usually go well in the same sentence. Normally, you'd want it to be as big and as heavy of a machine as you could get your hands on. And this, well, let's just say it could easily do with being about five times heavier, at least for machining steel. You know, it's fine doing aluminium and plastic, but steel is always a killer for these small machines. But having spent quite a lot of time going through the mill and upgrading it, well, it's not perfect, but it is a lot better than it was when I first got it. And that's what I'd like to go over in this video, sort of what's gone well and why. The first half are going to be quality of life improvements, and the second half are going to be performance related. So let's get the obvious one out of the way, and... You all knew it was going to be here, and that's going to be to add a digital readout or DRO to the mill. I've talked about it before many times, but if you don't know, a digital readout effectively tells you the position of the table or the workpiece of the cutter down to about 5 or so microns of accuracy, and it displays it here on well, the digital readout. And if I move the table, it's going to show up on the display just how far I've moved it, or we can set it to zero or set offsets and we can very easily keep track of our position. Now obviously I could do all this before I had a DRO. You know, there's dials on the hand wheel and there is a large scale on the front of the table which allows you to do, well, effectively the same thing. But having a digital readout just makes your life a lot easier. However, the big reason why I bought a digital readout is because of backlash on the mill. You know, the table is driven by a lead screw and nut, and like every screw and nut out there, there's going to be some play in the fit. This essentially prevents it from binding up, but it does result in a bit of dead space where, as you spin the hand wheel, there's no movement on the table. For instance, on the x-axis, that's about 0.34 millimeters of dead space. Effectively, I can spin the handle all I want, and in this dead space, there's going to be no movement on the table. And of course, you do need to account for that. You know, 034 millimeters is quite a lot of travel, especially when we're talking about milling. And it becomes especially important when you want to mill in two directions. For example, when you're milling out a pocket, you do need to account for this 0.34 millimeters of backlash in both directions, or I guess every time you change direction. And of course, the same thing goes for the y-axis, although the backlash on the y-axis is different. Now, it must be said, doing this isn't impossible. You know, I've done work on milling machines without DROs, but it's not something that I want to do by choice. You know, if there's any upgrade worth doing, at least when you first get a milling machine, it's this one. DROs are also pretty useful for doing other things. You know, they can calculate the coordinates for doing hole patterns, which I've used quite a few times in the past. Now, price-wise, they can be a little bit expensive. You know, I prefer the glass linear scales, and a kit plus the readouts can come in at over three or four hundred dollars. You know, more if you go for a name brand kit or one with a one micron scale over the five micron. But if you're like me and doing all of this on a budget, if you simply buy a kit and you get the five micron scales, it's going to be well worth the investment, and you're going to be just fine. All in all, it's a pretty good investment and one that I'd make pretty quickly after getting a milling machine. The second upgrade I recommend, especially if you have a lot of different pieces of tooling, is a quick change tooling system. You know, at least for me, it really changed how I used the mill. Now, for context, when I first got the milling machine, I held pretty much everything I had in this Morse taper to ER32 collet chuck. I'd be able to take the chuck, a collet that would fit the tool, and pretty much hold the tool, and it would do it quite well. But when it came time to swapping tools in and out, well, that was a different matter because it could easily take two or three minutes to change out a tool and to make one simple part may take four or five different swaps of tooling to be made in order to make the part. And this is where the quick change system comes in. I first bought a 20 millimeter Morse Tabor 3 collet 
and some ER20 holders with a 20mm shank. The Morse taper collet permanently sits in the spindle and I use it to grip the shank of the tool holders. And doing it this way means I can do tooling swaps in about 20 seconds or so. As a quality of life improvement, this was easily one of the biggest that I've made. Now obviously this is a compromise. You do lose out on a bit of concentricity in the part. You know, you may get 15 or so microns of run out and it is slightly less rigid than it would be holding it directly in the spindle. But for the vast majority of the work that I do, this is well worth the trade off and well within the bounds of what I need. Now in terms of tool holders, you can go about this in a number of different ways. You know, since I do have a lathe, I was able to make up a few end mill holders using some scrap metal and a boring bar. Or if you really wanted to, you could use a reamer. And this thing here is as complicated as it looks. You know, it's a 20 mil shank on one end, a flared out register on the other, and in the middle, a very precisely machined 10 millimeter bore or 12 millimeter bore, depending on the end mill, machined through the middle. The end mill has a flat ground on one side and it's all held in place by a grub screw. This thing here really only took about 10, 20 minutes to make and for what, about a dollar worth of materials. However, I generally only use it for my roughing end mills. Everything else, however, is gonna be held in ER collet holders and it makes a lot more sense to buy them than to make them. I did make a few the first time I did this, but the results weren't that good. Honestly, even the cheap Chinese ones are actually pretty good quality these days. The ones that I do buy are called C20 ER20-100L tool holders, and I just buy them off AliExpress. The price on them varies massively, but if you search around or wait for a sale, generally they can be had for about $15 a piece. You know, and really, I wouldn't pay more than $20 for one. Now, unfortunately, 100 millimeters is the shortest shank length that they make, and that's still too long. So what I do when I get them is I cut them down to length to fit the Morse taper collars. And since I do have a lathe, I then clean it up. And that is just about perfect. And that fits about 90% of all my mill tools. And of course it must be said, because I have gone all in on this system, I made all my milling tools to have a similar 20 mm shank to match. It just means that I can very easily go from using an end mill to say a boring head and then moving on to a fly cutter in a matter of seconds. Now I will quickly say that this system is very similar to the Tormark TTS system, except that system uses a three quarter inch shank. Now if you don't have a lathe or you don't want to make your own tool holders, you can simply get a 3 quarter inch collet to match your milling machine spindle and then simply buy the Toolmark tooling from them. From what I hear, the Toolmark stuff is pretty good quality, it's just going to be a little bit more expensive than doing it my way. Either way, in my opinion, this is a fantastic setup for lighter machines, especially those with a Morse taper. The next upgrade worth doing is going to be adding power feeds to both the table and the head. Now this is in no way an attempt to CNC convert the mill. You know, CNC and manual mills both have their places in a workshop. But after a while, you know, even I can admit, cranking the hand wheel can get a bit tiring. And this is where power feeds come in. And all they are, are just motors, usually with a clutch for engaging and disengaging the gearbox when it's not being used. And you use it to do all the boring work. Now, the range and the prices can vary depending on the machine, but most manufacturers should offer them, at least power tables. Sieg, the brand that makes my milling machine, do offer a power feed. However, it is overpriced for what it was, so I went ahead and made my own. However, they don't offer a power lift for the head, so once again, I had to go in and make my own. Now, if you do own a Precision Matthews mill, I'm pretty sure that Priest Tools over in America do make dedicated kits for your mills, so you will need to check that out. And I'm sure the same thing applies for whatever brand of milling machine you own. All in all, they were good upgrades. Definitely not at the top of my list, although if you ask some other people, getting one of them was their first priority. So it generally is going to be up to you when you want to get one. Although at least for me, getting a powered lift for the head was a lot more important than getting a powered table feed for the table. And the final quality of life upgrade, and I can loosely call it an upgrade, but one thing I do want to mention is to buy or at least make a speed handle for your vice.
You know, the cast one that generally comes with most vices is, in my opinion, a bit rubbish. And it's also quite awkward to use. So what I did was I went ahead and made a new one. It's kind of started to look like a vault door handle, although mostly it's designed to be, well, functional. And what it does is it very quickly lets you spin the lead screw to open or close the vise. And in my opinion, this design works really well. But you know, they come in many different styles and it's really up to you how you want to go about this. All in all, I really like mine. The only downside is I made it from sulfurized steel and that stuff is damn well near impossible to weld. So one day I will need to remake it from some more weldable steel. But if you're looking for a very quick afternoon project, this is one that I can very definitely recommend. Now starting on the performance upgrades, I think the best thing I ever did to the milling machine was to add a coolant system to the mill. Now I know some people can go their whole hobby without putting one on, but with one, you know, I've been able to push the cutters harder and they last for so much longer than without having one. And that is important when I have to remove large amounts of steel. If I was only doing aluminium, you know, I wouldn't have bothered, but steel can very easily chew up in mill life. And generally speaking, it's not very easy, or I guess worth it, to resharpen end mills, especially in the type of workshop that I have. You know, if you have a tool and cutter grinder, that's fine, but I don't currently have one. And as a result, I like to keep my end mills in good working condition for as long as possible. You know, especially when a sudden end mill can easily cost 50 bucks a piece. You know, if I'm burning through them, it's going to be a very short-lived hobby. Now, before I talk any further, I do need to quickly point out that I went completely overkill for my setup. You know, I'd always wanted to see if I could install a flood coolant, so that's why I did install a flood coolant, but really, you'd never need a setup like this on a small mill. You know, this is completely brilliant. It keeps the end mills and the work pieces cool, which is a good thing, but it does make a horrible mess. Now the way this setup works is it's powered by a pond pump and all of the coolant drains into a big 25 litre tub under the mill. The total cost was about 100 bucks plus the cost of the coolant which is mixed in about a 10% ratio with water to add a bit of lubricity and prevent rusting. Now would I recommend this setup? Well, if you're not afraid of creating a little bit of mess, you know, go ahead. But if you do need to keep your workshop a little bit clean, this is not the setup for you. You know, this setup works so well, but um, I only use it when I have to do heavy work. The rest of the time, I use the same coolant in a spray bottle. However, if you have plumbed in air in your workshop, or even a small air compressor, what I would recommend is a mistless air sprayer, and that would be a really good option to look into. Something such as a fog buster, which sprays a little bit of coolant onto the end milk to keep it cool, but not too much to essentially flood it and create a mess. Just make sure to stay away from those mist coolant setups at all costs. You know, the last thing you want is to fill up your workshop with atomized coolant and then have to breathe it in. You know, that's the last thing that you'd want to do. If you look at the MSDSs for most coolants, most of them do say that you should avoid breathing this stuff in. All in all, if you can take one thing away from this section of the video, it's make sure to keep your end mills and your workpiece cool and you're going to have a much better time, better results and better end mill life. Now, whilst we're on the subject of overkill, let's very quickly talk about the motor. You know, last year I replaced the stock one horsepower brushed DC motor with a three phase, three horsepower induction motor. And that, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. This thing here is completely overkill and it looks a little bit goofy, but the results that I'm getting out of it are just, well, amazing. Now, if I'm being completely honest, all along I knew I was gonna do something like this. The factory motor that I had was just lacking grunt, especially at low RPM. But originally my plan was to simply switch it out from a one horsepower brushed motor to say a brushless motor. I only did the three horsepower motor thing because, well, I had a three horsepower motor left over from the mini lathe. But so far I'm pretty happy that I did do that and contrary to what some people were thinking, it hasn't killed the milling machine just yet. Although I am probably gonna replace the spindle bearings to two sets of tapered roller bearings just to be on the safe side. Obviously though, at the same time, I am being very careful not to push this milling machine too far. 
However, with that said, I wouldn't give this milling machine motor up for anything. You know, it can chew almost through anything that I throw at it, and I mean, the results are just fantastic. Would I recommend it though? Well, no. You know, I might recommend ditching, like if you have a brushed motor, for instance, to a brushless one, but doing something like this is a little bit overkill and just a bit expensive for what it was. I think doing this cost me about 500 bucks and yeah, that was a little bit expensive. Point being, if I offer a brushed version when you're buying the mill, just get that one instead. Then you don't have to worry about upgrading it later on. What I would recommend though, is adding some sort of stiffening bracket to the back of the column to help with rigidity. You know, at least on these smaller mills like this, or at least the column mills, the back of the column is cast like an open C channel and the back of it is left open. So I was experiencing rigidity issues. So what I did was I bought a big plate of 20 millimeter thick steel and I bolted it to the back of the column. In effect, this closed off the C channel to make it more of a box section. Rigidity wise, it gives it a bit more resistance from bending backwards, but it gives it a lot more resistance from twisting, which you also don't want under load and what I suspect was happening as I was milling. All in all, the upshot was it did help and I could take much heavier, much faster cuts. And speaking of damping vibrations, you know, as a very last ditch method to push the milling machine even further, I filled the milling machine up with about 20 kilos of lead and about the same amount on top of that with epoxy granite and cast iron. Mostly trying to dampen vibrations by adding mass, which is not a super uncommon approach. Now thankfully, yes, it did work. But at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do to the milling machine. So this is really the last thing you would want to do to try and improve your milling machine. And the final thing I want to talk about, and one thing that I probably should have been talking about earlier, and that is scraping the gibs to make sure they fit, or at least checking them to make sure that they fit as well as they could possibly fit. Now, if you don't already know, the gibs are these tapered pieces of cast iron that fit between the saddle and the table and help apply pressure between these two surfaces in order to take up slack and make everything more rigid. Now that's all fine and good, except the gibs from the factory had warped for whatever reason, and there was hardly any contact area between the two surfaces. As a result, you had to apply a lot of pressure on the gibs to keep everything rigid, and that would tend to bind up the table. So what I resorted to doing was scraping them flat, using some Prussian blue as a sort of indicator of contact between the two surfaces. And what I did was I took a carbide scraper made from a paint scraper, which was bolted to a piece of steel to effectively remove the material until I got a better contact patch. Sort of simple, but time consuming. You know, scraping is a bit of an art form and scraping the cast iron that the gibbs were made of was quite difficult because it is a very hard cast iron but the end result was the contact patch was increased and the area that I needed to apply to the gibbs was reduced. This made the overall setup just a little bit more rigid. Now obviously I'm not expecting you to go out and get a scraper specifically to do this but if you have one on hand it wouldn't be a bad idea at least to check it and see what the contact patch is like on your mill. And that, ladies and gentlemen, are the major upgrades which got the milling machine to be effectively what it is today, which is a good workhorse machine given the size of the space that I have for it. Yes, one day I would like a proper knee mule of some type, but given the size of the space that I have, you know, I wouldn't want anything else. Overall, I hope you find this list useful. You know, obviously, I don't think it's 100% necessary that you do all of them. You know, if you just pick and choose the ones that best suits you and your setup and your needs, you're going to end up with a pretty good machine. And that's about it for now. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week.